Good morning. It's good to see each of you this morning, especially those of you who are visiting with us. We love to have visitors, and we want you to feel that you are a part of our family this morning as we worship, because we adopt you immediately as you walk in the door, because we want you to be that much a part of us, and uh, we want you to come and be with us whenever you can. I was talking to someone the other day, and in the course of our conversation, he made this observation. It is so easy to fill our lives with if only. Filling up the spaces of life that ought to be lived with regrets. If only I had, or if only I had not. If only I had known. A great tragedy to fill up one's life with if onlys. I want to settle on one of those if onlys this morning, taken from the life of our Lord. Jesus had been carrying on his ministry in Judea. Now he and his disciples were returning to Galilee. They were passing through Samaria, and they came to that place on Jacob's field where Jacob had dug a well, a well that had nourished travelers for centuries as they had passed through that region a well now at which our Lord rested, while his disciples went to a nearby village to get food. As he waited, he grew thirsty. The well was deep. He had nothing by which he could lower into the water and bring up water for himself. And so it was in those moments of need that a woman from a nearby village, came to the well to draw water for herself. And Jesus said to her, Will you draw water for me to drink? What was unusual about this request was the fact that she was a Samaritan and she was a Samaritan woman. Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. To think that a Jew would drink from a vessel owned by a Samaritan staggered the imagination. It did hers. How is it that you, being a Jew, would ask of me, a Samaritan woman, that I give you to drink? It must have touched Jesus because he discontinued that part of the conversation, turned it around, and began to speak to her of something far more vital. He said, If only you knew who I am. If only you knew the things that I could give you. If only. If only we knew who Christ is. Poor little Jesus boy, born long time ago, and they didn't know who you were. When I first came to Newport, shortly after I had become your pastor, Francis told me of one of our church members who was ill and needed a visit. So she gave me directions to find that man's house, and I set out. I found it easily enough. Her directions were clear. I knocked at the door, and the man came to the door, swung it open, and with a big smile on his face said, Come on in. And I did. And I thought immediately, How does he know me so readily? I don't believe he's been at church since I've been there, but... I was flattered by the fact that he received me so warmly, so I came in and sat down. In a moment, his wife came into the room, and so the three of us sat there. I inquired of his health. He didn't seem to be in need of a pastoral visit. His illness didn't seem to be crippling in any way. 
His wife sat there, not speaking, just a frozen smile on her face. We had a delightful visit, and then when I got ready to leave, I was about to call us for a moment of prayer, and he said, well, I sure have enjoyed this visit, even if I don't know who you are. It was then that I realized that I had taken too much for granted by that warm reception at the door. He was a total stranger. Francis had given me the wrong directions. When I came back to the office, I got the right directions and went again and found the person I was looking for. Enjoyed the visit, but I still don't know who you are. Do we really know Christ? Is he one that we can feel a kinship with? Is he one with whom we walk in fellowship or we only, do we only know him by name and at a distance? It's such an imperative that we know Christ. And the way in which we can determine whether or not we truly know Christ is to ask the question, do I know him so well that I can introduce him to someone else? We can introduce persons to strangers if we know them. But if we don't know them well, there's little we can do in making them known to someone else. Harry Denman was one of the great saints of our church. In years past, he was the head of the Department of Evangelism of the Methodist Church. Stories abound about the deep commitment of Harry Denman. But it is said of him that rarely did he go into a restaurant that before he left, he found a table with a vacant chair where there seemed to be a need, and he would go and sit down, introduce himself, I'm Harry Denman, and I want you to meet my friend. And he would proceed to tell them about Christ. Not many of us have that kind of grace and confidence that we could do that with perfect strangers. But are we able to introduce Christ to our friends? Do, know, do we know him well enough? Jesus said, if you only knew who I am. If only you knew the things that I could give you. The great benefactor. We've always said in terms of reaching proficiency in our vocation, developing social relationships, getting ahead in our jobs, getting opportunities for advancement. If you just know the right persons, you can get ahead. It's important to know the right persons. It's hard to get ahead on your own, but to have a benefactor. In my church in Johnson City, I had a man who was coming close to the century mark in his life, a man by the name of Robert E. Lee, his full name. When he was a boy living in Washington County, his father owned a farm. And on one occasion on that farm, when he was just a boy, three men came and camped there overnight and remained for a day or two. These were famous campers who camped together throughout the East. Henry Ford... John Burroughs, the great naturalist, and Harvey Firestone, three bosom buddies who often went camping together. And on this occasion, they had chosen to camp out on Bob Lee's farm, his father's farm. In the evening, they built a campfire, and young Bob wandered over to where they were. And he stood, warming himself by the fire. Henry Ford turned to him and said, Young man, do you know who I am? And the young boy said, no, sir, I don't. And he said, well, I'm Henry Ford. And Bob said, do you know who I am? And Henry Ford said, no. He said, well, I'm Robert E. Lee. And this so captured the imagination of Henry Ford that after his chuckles, he picked up a piece of wood that they'd been whittling on. He said, I want you to carve your name in this piece of wood. And he did. They entertained him for the evening, and when he left to go back home, he said, young man, if you're ever in need of a job, you come to Detroit. 
and I'll see that you have a job. Well, the years passed. Robert E. Lee grew up to be a young man. He visited Detroit, went to the Dearborn Museum, and there he was surprised to discover in one of the showcases a piece of wood that bore his name. He had carved his name there, and here it was on display as a part of the memorabilia of Henry Ford and his relationship with Burroughs and Firestone. He was flattered by that. And then the depression struck. He lost his job. Knowing that many years had passed since his encounter with Henry Ford, he was at the point of desperation, so he went to Detroit. And he went to the corporate offices, and he found Henry Ford's own personal suite. And he went to the receptionist, and he told the receptionist why he was there. That many years ago, on an occasion in which Henry Ford was camping on his father's farm, that he had told him, if ever you need a job, come and see me. And he said, I'm here and the receptionist sent word. In a few moments, a man strode out of the office, and he extended his hand, and he said, Henry Ford is tied up in a business conference right now, but when he was given your message, he told me to come out, and I was to attend personally to see that you were given a job. And so Bob Lee got a job at Detroit and went through the Depression, when the Depression was over, he came back home and settled in Johnson City, his hometown, with newspaper clippings that he would always pull out and show you, telling about the time that he met Henry Ford on his father's farm. A benefactor. People who can do something for you, and when your need is greatest, they come through. That's important, and that's what Jesus promised. If only you knew the things that I could do for you. You draw water from this well, but you'll be thirsty again. When the sun rises tomorrow, it will be as though you didn't drink today. But the water that I give, you will drink and never be thirsty again. My real gift to you is the water of eternal life. There's no benefactor that can give us that. No one that we can know that can provide that for us, except one. Looking in the face of the woman despised by his own people, he said, if only you knew to ask, I could give you eternal life. Well, he's there for the asking but we've got to know him before we can ask. Let these be the thoughts by which we commune this morning at the table of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we would not presume to enter into your presence if you had not invited us and you have, you have called us, you have urged us to come. And we enter into those secret places where you only can take us. In the secret places of our hearts and in the secret places of our minds, we would entertain you there in this time together. That we might search your thoughts and know your thoughts, discover your ways and integrate into our lives the ways that you taught us as the way to live. You have been so generous in your promises. You have been so generous in your gifts. Not one of us has escaped those times when you have given to us that which we could never provide for ourselves. It is with a sense of unworthiness that we ex accept your gifts, but it is the knowledge that we can overcome our unworthiness, that we strive to go from the place of your blessing to the place of your promises. In this hour, we come to holy times in which we celebrate your presence among us. 
partaking of the body and blood, representative of your gift of reconciliation. In the taking of these elements, help us to be prayerful in our acceptance of that gift and the, expect and the expectation of even greater gifts that you have promised. Prepare us for them. Give us a sense of gratitude that we might be truly grateful for that which we so often take for granted. For we are not worthy ever to accept your holy gifts. Your one gift in return is our gratitude. Help us to be sensitive and to be ever grateful for all of your blessings which come to us daily in our daily bread as well as in our spiritual bread. And make us receptive to your gift as we become tolerant of those things about us which are different from the way in which we think and do but are part of the style and life of others. We would not be separated from others because of our intolerance, but give us a love that surmounts intolerance so that we can accept one another even when we think and act differently. It is one of your greater gifts to be able to love the unlovely and to accept those who are unwilling to accept us. May this be a time of spiritual reconciliation in our hearts as we are able to reach out and to love all in spite of that which separates us and prepare us in our hearts and minds for your gift by the commitment of our own gifts and talents. As we use them to make the lives of others better, we are doing it unto you. As we use them to bring others into a knowing relationship with you, we know that we are being your instruments. Help us, Father, in accepting your gift to offer gifts of our own. Look into our hearts as we wait before you. Know the needs of each person that is here. Bless them in ways they need you most. And for those who are absent from us, whose needs may be even greater, we pray for them. Reach down to them wherever they are and help them to reach up and accept that which you offer. Now be in our hearts in our minds, and in our lives as we celebrate your presence in this holy sacrament through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.